so now we're going to go ahead and jump into our interview with Carrie O'Quinn, the father of Fangoria, as well as the new guy on the block who is not so new. He's actually a big horror fan and been a fan of film for many, many years. His name is Dallas Saunier, and uh, you guys are going to want to stick around for that. So we're going to do that right now. Today we have writer, magazine publisher, director, producer, actor, and even possibly a composer of music who is most known for the creation of Starlog, Cinemagic, Future Life, Rock Video, Hard Rock, Comic Scene, Magazines, but for us horror buffs out there, he is the father of none other than the beloved Fangoria Magazine, Carrie O'Quinn. Hey, Carrie. Hey, you, you forgot uh, female wrestling. That was also one of the magazines. <laughs> also with us today, guys, is Hunter Wayne, who is a producer, writer, and a manager for Psycho Bastardo Creations. He's made the short Death Mention and a Lost Boy. He's a fellow horror fan. He's Carrie's personal assistant and confidant. How's it going, Hunter? Going all right. How about you? <laughs> Good, man. Uh, I haven't seen these, by the way, Hunter, so I, I definitely am interested. So you'll have to tell me where to get these. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll hook you up, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome to Beyond the Void Horror Podcast, guys. How is everybody doing today? Pretty good. Pretty yeah. good for an old human being. <laughs> I wanted to ask you guys, by the way, how did you two meet? Do <laughs> you want to tell the story? We met at a, a screening of The Shape of Water, Guillermo del Toro's movie. Uh, I've known Guillermo for many years, but this was a screening that was uh, produced by Legion M, which is a new organization that is devoted to fandom. They have fans as the financers and owners and producers of different projects that they're interested in. And I'm on the board of advisors for Legion M, and so I came to the screening at their invitation. And afterwards, there was this kid there with long hair almost down to his waist and everything. And I said, I like people who are unusual humans. And <laughs> lo and behold, I got to talking to him and discovered he was from Austin, Texas, which is my hometown. So we hit it off and became friends almost immediately. Awesome. Yeah, so it's relatively soon. Re yeah. Recent, I should say. Well, and, and Hunter is learning to shave now, so he's kind of excited about that. <laughs> I didn't used to have that problem. <laughs> None of us did to begin with. <laughs> well, obviously, Carrie, I mean, I want to know a little bit about some of the origins of Fangoria, but I also want to know about you, uh, and I think our listeners would too. I mean, can you kind of tell us some of your first inspiration uh, to do something creative or be a part of something uh, in the film world or uh, creative space? I know that you worked on like a romance magazine in the beginning, but where did you, uh, where was your first interest in creativity? Well, uh, my interest in creativity started when I was truly a, a kid. I mean, uh, before I even reached my teens. I was uh, kind of fascinated with comic books. And uh, when I was growing up, it was radio. And I listened to The Shadow and I listened to, you know, all kinds of exciting shows on radio that I was addicted to, including Sky King and what, one thing and another. And uh, when I was very young, I started drawing my own comic book characters. And I created, when I was just a kid, I created a, a strange little character called Bug Eye Beetle. And he was a, a weird little, you know, insect creature, and he was my hero. And then as I grew a little older, I got interested in actual human beings and created a character called Buzzy Wilson. And he was kind of my teenage character. And I was drawing comic strips and posting them on my bulletin board and making my friends come over once a week to keep up with the adventures of Bug Eye Beetle or Buzzy Wilson. 
And uh, my very first hero in the world was Mighty Mouse. Nice. And um, I, I just loved him because he not only saved the world, but he sang as he flew in to save the world. <laughs> and I thought, that, you know, I don't know, it was just creative and unusual things like that that kind of excited me and and generated my interest in the whole field of creativity, of heroism, adventures, and uh, all the kind of stuff I later got involved in professionally. I graduated from Mighty Mouse. Well, well, let me tell you, first of all, my first job when I was in fourth grade, I mean, I was actually, what, about 10, 11 years old. And I lived in Austin, Texas, and the legislature was having a special session, and my mother worked in the Senate there, in the state Senate, and she said they're looking for page boys in the House of Representatives for about two months for this special session. So I got out of school and worked as a page boy in the House of Representatives for about eight weeks. Wow. And I made my first money, which was so exciting to me because I was able to go out and buy every 16 millimeter Castle Films movie animated film of Mighty Mouse. And I owned all the Mighty Mouse films that were available at the time. I didn't have any money left over. I spent every (laughs) dollar that I earned, but I had a collection that I could watch on my little eight millimeter projector. And uh, this is, you know, this is way back in ancient times, but uh, (laughs) that was, that was how I spent my money. And I said, wow, making money is exciting. And it lets me see more of the things that I love and am passionate about. Do you still have those? I think I have some of them at my home in Austin, along with a lot of magic apparatus, because I also became a magician. And I I bought magic tricks and performed magic shows at birthday parties and other events and got paid for it. And I loved it. And I actually built and created a lot of my own magic apparatus, too. So I was I was very into magic, too, because it was kind of, you know, like what I enjoy about movies today in special effects right and you know it's the magic of movies and i was interested in things that are not everyday and ordinary but things that kind of bring the wonder and the and the magic to human existence that's amazing yeah so you've been you've uh, hit a lot of goals <laughs> too many <laughs> when i went to the university of texas as a student I started off as an acting major because in high school, I had been very active in the drama club and had the leads in most of the plays. And, uh, you know, I was a pretty darn good actor. So I went to the University of Texas starting out as an acting major. And in my second year, all the acting majors had to take a class called scene design and they hated it. They hated it because they didn't know how to draw and design a set and that sort of thing. And I loved it and I was good at it. And I said, this is crazy. I don't want to be a starving actor the rest of my life. I'm an, I'm an artist. I've been drawing cartoons and paintings and that sort of thing for my whole youth. And so I switched to the field of uh, studio art. And I was in that field for two years at the University of Texas. And then I was appointed as art director of the Texas Ranger, which was the student humor magazine. And uh, lo and behold, I discovered that I enjoyed designing advertising and, and magazines and drawing covers and all kinds of things, you know, and I said, I don't want to be a starving artist the rest of my life. I'm going to switch to the field of commercial art. So for the next two years, I majored in commercial art. So I was at the university for six years, majored in three different things. And when I finally told my parents, it's time for me to go out into the real world, I didn't have a degree. I never got a degree, but I had six years of education in several different fields at the University of Texas. But that's been the story of my life. I've always been interested in too many things. (laughs) And I've been able to develop talents in a lot of different fields. 
And so I just keep switching from one thing to another. And that's once once Norman and I started our publishing company in New York, I was I had a kind of a playpen where I could not only, you know, work on magazines and do the design and, and hand letter, the logos and all that kind of stuff, but I could photograph interviews, I could write articles and editorials, and uh, you know, I could bring all of my different interests and abilities into play. And then when we started O'Quinn Productions, which was the production branch of our company, Mm -hmm. and I started working to produce video programming for Paramount and a lot of other video companies, and HBO came to me and asked me to uh, produce, uh, to, you know, develop a science fiction series. This was back in the 80s, before HBO was producing series programming. They were just doing music and sports specials. And uh, I developed a series for them, which never actually made it to the air because at the end of the year, they paid me damn good money to do it. But at the end of the year, they said, we've decided that we're not going to go into competition with the major networks. We're just going to continue to do the specials that we are making money on. So they didn't produce any of the three shows that they had asked different people to develop for them. And of course, obviously, HBO later changed their mind on that. And they're now <laughs> some of the most original and uh, wonderful series programming that's on cable television. I have to ask you, too, and I'm sure you don't get this question a lot, <laughs> if ever. I don't know. But it says online that you've dabbled in some music. And I'm curious because I write music myself. Uh, and it says as early as uh, 1964, you even helped do some music for the horror movie It Lives Again uh, from 1978. Is that correct? Well, let me uh, explain that. I've always loved music. And uh, I even wrote a movie musical back in the 50s when I was a, a senior in high school. And we shot a lot of the movie. Uh, we never finished it because it, it took too many months to do. And we were all seniors in high school. And one of, the, one of my stars went off to join the Army. Another one went up to TCU and uh, Texas Tech to go to school. So everybody left town. We never finished the movie. Oh, wow. But I did in music all my life. Now, what happened was when when Norman and I were, you know, uh, had our publishing company up and running, and we were actually making money and realized that we weren't going to go out of business next week, <laughs> I was able to begin some projects that I particularly loved. And I was totally in love with movie music. I had every LP, every vinyl album for every soundtrack that was ever made. And I was particularly in love with kind of the great classic composers like Alfred Newman and Miklas Rosa and uh, Eric Wolfgang Korngold and, you know, people of that sort. And what I was able to do was to begin to produce record albums, soundtracks. I saved the classic science fiction film Rocket Ship XM. The soundtrack music was composed by Ferdy Grofay, the ma- amazing American composer who, among other things, uh, composed the Grand Canyon Suite and a lot of classical music. But he did three movies, and Rocket Ship XM was one of them. Right. I got the original master discs, which were these huge 16-inch transcription discs, before they even recorded in studios with tape, magnetic tape, you know. So I got these discs from the man who was the conductor and arranger for that score, a man named Albert Glasser. I met him out here in Hollywood on a trip. We became friends, and he loaned me these discs. I took them back to New York, had CBS engineers clean them up, and we that was the first soundtrack album that Starlog Records released. And then I went on to do, the one you're talking about was a Bernard Herrmann score for It's Alive 2. I didn't compose the music, but I, Mm -hmm. again, that was a, a, Herrmann was one of the great composers. He did almost all of the Alfred Hitchcock movies. Right, yeah. Including North by Northwest which was one of my favorite Hitchcock movies and one of Herman's best scores. It had never been recorded. The soundtrack had never been released. But I said, instead of doing, you know, getting the old tapes, which were mono, 
uh, at that point we were into the 80s and digital had just just been invented and so i went over to london and recorded with the london studio symphony orchestra the soundtrack score for north by northwest and it was very one of the first digital soundtrack albums ever released and i was able to do a number of albums of that sort which we sold in the magazine and which for a saraband actually produced the album so we worked in conjunction with them because they were company and still are mm -hmm. and, uh, so i was able to do uh, a lot of soundtrack albums and produce them write the liner notes design the covers and even, I even designed the record, the labels, which was very exciting to me. But then when Paramount asked me to produce a Fangoria video series called Scream Greats, I decided to compose the main title music for that, that we used at the opening and at the closing of each episode. And so a lot of the composition, which I had just done for fun, and I'd recorded a lot of songs and music and stuff just for fun just for my own pleasure and for my friends but finally i got to compose music that was actually used in a professional project and now today i am composing the soundtrack score for a feature documentary film which is going to be finished and released by the end of this summer called from the bridge and uh i'm working with a a music producer that I've worked with before on a Broadway show that I wrote. And uh, so anyway, we're, we're doing the score for a full feature film. And that's one of the most exciting creative things that I am doing these days. That's awesome. I'm really excited to hear that. Actually. I want to, I want to check that out. Is there any time that we might be able to check that out? Like when are they uh, going to round everything up? Well, I'll tell you what the producer who's working with me, just did 60 seconds of the opening main title music so that we could all hear it and the and the director and the and the you know the financiers and the people involved in this documentary could see if you know they this is the kind of music they want for the show or or if Kerry O'Quinn is just you know being pushy and you know trying to <laughs> do something that he's not really qualified to do <laughs> well all, i would be honored if you guys would send me a clip of that we can play that and I can say that right now so that people can check it out. We will do that and but it's it's again it's just the first minute and it's just what you would call a sketch version of it. In other words, it's not an orchestra. He just on his computer system in his studio, he just put together uh, a few instruments so to speak digitally that kind of that would give us the feeling of this music and we could hear how it sounds and and I've played it for a lot of different people, and the word that everybody says in reaction to it is that it's thrilling. And that's the most exciting thing in the world to me because that's exactly what I wanted. It was a thrilling opening to a documentary so that you don't feel like you're about to see something that is just, you know, kind of talking heads and educational. Well, and guys, what we'll do right now is let you guys hear that track right now. Uh, as he said, it is a scratch track, so it's not exactly 100% done. It's just to get the general gist, but you guys can listen to that right now. Here it is, the opening title music for From the Bridge. I wanted to ask you also, I mean, obviously you have a lot of history in the zine world. Uh, and, and what led you to Fangoria magazine? I know that there was 
sort of a name change there because of a, a weird lawsuit with a similar name zine. That's right. Well, we, we started Starlog in 1976, which was America's bicentennial year. And there was absolutely no science fiction alive at the time. There was nothing on television. There were no science fiction movies being made. And our magazine distributor really tried to talk us out of doing the magazine because they said, you're going to lose your shirts on this one. There's no audience out there for uh, a monthly science fiction magazine. I knew that the audience was out there. But at that time in 1976, that audience was fairly invisible. It was a time where Star Trek had already gone off the air, rerun Channel 9. And, uh, you know, Star Trek fans didn't want to be called Trekkies. They, they thought it was kind of degrading and humiliating. And so fandom was kind of hidden away and sort of embarrassed to be called geeks and that sort of thing. And I had to do a lot of research to prove to our magazine distributor that there was a kind of an invisible audience out there that we couldn't see them because they had never had a magazine of their own. And I started Starlog and we started it as a quarterly because our distributor wouldn't let us go to monthly to begin with. But the next year in 1977, a guy named George Lucas came out with a movie called Star Wars. And never heard of him. I'm kidding. <laughs> and we went monthly at that point and we were the voice of science fiction. And then about a year later, we were including Godzilla and Frankenstein because so much of science fiction was, uh, you know, stuff we had to, it was classic movies from the past, like the George Powell movies of the 1950s, War of the Worlds, When Worlds Collide, Conquest of Space, all of that kind of stuff, The Time Machine. I grew up on those movies and I loved them. But we were doing retrospectives on these old science fiction movies because there wasn't any new science fiction being made. But once Star Wars, you know, made the cover of Time magazine with exactly the same photograph that Starlog had on its cover, you know, and then Spielberg did Close Encounters and all of a sudden science fiction was alive again. And I said, we shouldn't be including Godzilla in Starlog. That's a separate area and people are interested in it because we were getting letters from fans who loved the horror that we put in Starlog. But I said, we should start a horror magazine that you know covers horror and fantasy. So we came up with a title, Fantastica. And I designed the logo and we did the first cover and we said we're and we put it in the magazine and said, you know, subscribe now, get start with issue number one of Fantastica. And we got sued by another magazine that was actually a science fiction magazine called Fantastic Films. And they took us to court and said that, you know, the upper left-hand corner of the magazine, which is often show on a newsstand, uh, if all you could see was F-A-N-T, that it was confusing and people would think Fantastica was fantastic films and we were kind of uh, getting in on their fame or something like that. Anyway, right. long story short is that uh, the court seemed to agree with that and said that we could not use the name Fantastica. So Norman and I were kind of lost. I had come up with the word Starlog because I didn't want to say, you know, Science Fiction Monthly or some dumb title like that. I wanted an original that actually, you know, was our own property. So I'd come up with Starlog and I said, that's what we need is a name like that for our horror magazine. One Monday morning, Norman, Norman Jacobs, my partner, came into the office and said, how's this? Fangoria. He said, listen to it. It's got fan in the title, it's got fang in the title, and it's got gore in the title. And I said, Norman, I love it. That's the title. So that was the title of our magazine. And we uh, I immediately, I re-lettered the logo and we designed the cover, which would have a kind of a film strip going down the left-hand side of the cover with uh, you know, one main picture on the cover, but then a bunch of smaller pictures to show, you know, the contents of the magazine. And we put out Fangoria, and lo and behold, it was a hit right from the start because horror movies had, they weren't taken seriously. Nobody, nobody, you know, they didn't win a war, 
and nobody thought they were, you know, anything serious in terms of Hollywood product. But they were always made because there was definitely an audience for horror. There always has been since the, the universal days of, uh, you know, the Wolfman and, and Frankenstein and all those classic movies. So Absolutely. And you started right before the big boom in the 80s, which is probably uh, the epitome of horror movie magic in a lot of ways uh, where it took off and where Fangoria was a big part of that. It wasn't, like you said, always welcomed as it is today, uh, even though it's still kind of a dark spot in people's vision sometimes. <laughs> but what were some of the experiences you had with the pushback from the world uh, when you started in 79 and so on? Do you have any crazy well, stories or anything? Not from the fans of the magazine. I mean, it hit right from the start. But what I did get was a lot of, you know, letters coming into the office uh, from people who bought the magazine, but also from their parents <laughs> and their teachers. And uh, you know, the fans loved the magazine because this is something they had waited for. And I think the fact that, you know, Fangoria was out there on the newsstand and was selling as a monthly magazine and had an audience and, you know, was attracting advertisers and all that kind of stuff. I think that's one of the things that kind of legitimized the field and made that 80s, you know, abundance of horror movies that kind of introduced a lot of great directors and writers and, and actors. Uh, I think that Fangoria had a big hand in legitimizing the field and letting people know that this was something that should be taken seriously, uh, at least in terms of something that made money at the box office. Right. But but anyway, uh, I got terrible letters from parents who said that mainly f regarding Fangori, but even with Starlog, I got letters from a mother who said, my little, you know, four-year-old son is wearing this Darth Vader mask and wheezing you know, he's, 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 his breath, he's trying to imitate Darth Vader, said, you've, you've made the worst villain in the world my son's hero, and you should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> and That's I great. mean, I got crazy letters like that from parents that really did not understand what the appeal was um, to their kids. And I got a letter from a, a teacher. I remember one in particular that she said, I found one of my students reading your trashy Fangoria magazine in class, hidden behind his textbook. And I grabbed it, took it up in front of the class, and I ripped it to shreds so the whole class could watch me do it. And then I took those pieces home and I burned them in my fireplace. She said, Mr. O'Quinn, you are going to roast in hell because you are turning the children of our country into serial killers. <laughs> wow. And clearly, she did not understand what the appeal was either. That's that's pretty interesting, though. And I'm sure you got plenty of letters for that. That's I've always felt like Fangory really did push the industry uh, quite a bit. It gave people an outlet for something that they had long before the internet was a thing. And it gave them a place to kind of not feel ashamed. Uh, and, and exactly. you took it from like some sort of subversive, shameful thing that society pushed in everybody's face and then turned it into proud fandom, which is amazing. Well, and, and that was the whole idea. I mean, I got a letter from a mother once who said, my son is down in our basement mixing up fake blood. This is what you've done to him, Mr. Quinn. <laughs> and, you know, I, I said, you know, what I'm doing is not inspiring people to be serial killers, but people to be filmmakers. And lo and behold, a lot of people who grew up on my magazines, including Cinemagic, are now making movies in Hollywood. And some of them are horror movies. I mean, people like Wes Craven and Toby Hooper were part of that world. Right. Uh, Robert Rodriguez entered my Cinemagic short film search when he was just a teenager in Texas. And people like Guillermo del Toro loved the magazines. He once said, Carrie, none of us would be in this business if it weren't for you and your magazines. J.J. Abrams grew up uh, being inspired by Cinemagic and being educated about how to do special effects and all kinds of things for you know movies before he got to Hollywood and became the amazing writer, producer, director that he is today. 
Yeah, that's see, that's that's how you know. <laughs> and oh, it was cool. such it's such a big thing in the eighties too. And I mean, I, I, one of the things I wanted to ask you about because I know you you did the documentary because you were doing the um, Fangoria Weekend of Horrors, uh, which I believe started in eighty six and it was a triannual thing. Although I think apparently you guys did more than that each year, but you did a documentary back then and I, I love that documentary. And if you guys haven't seen it, by the way, that are listening, you need to watch it. It's really great. It's got all the people in it, all the people that you, you love and appreciate. Well, and we did that because, uh, we had done conventions in different cities around the country in conjunction with creation convention, who was, you know, they had, it's now called Creation Entertainment. But they had uh, they had produced conventions for years. And I got together with Gary and Ag, the guys who ran Creation, and we had a meeting and they said, you know, we should team up in some way because you have these great magazines and you've gathered the audience and it's the same audience that we're dealing with with our conventions. So we decided to team up and work together. And we created uh we did a star log convention or two we did several of them right but the, the fangoria weekend of horrors was huge and suddenly we decided to do one here in los angeles and it was at the ambassador hotel which is kind of a classic hotel that's no longer a hotel here the building is still there but i think it's a school now but it was a great classic hotel and because we were in hollywood suddenly a lot of the people that were involved in the world of horror were right here with us. And we had Wes Craven and we had Toby Hooper and we had Robert England and we had Elvira. And, you know, we had this roster of all the stars of the horror field that were right here in town. So they all went over there and I said, you know what? A, a fan convention has never been captured on video and to show the whole weekend and all the crazy fun that fans have and how they dress up and how they, you know, are kind of addicted to all of these celebrities that nobody else much cares about. And so I got a bunch of cameras and a whole crew and we decided to document the whole weekend. And that's what we did and turned out a an hour uh, video called Fangoria Weekend of Horrors. And again, you're right. I would I would say anyone who's ever been a fan of science fiction, horror, fantasy, comics, superheroes, any of that, would be fascinated to see this Fangoria Weekend of Horrors video, which is still available. In fact, Hunter and I were just at uh, uh, an event here in L.A. called Monster Palooza. Right. And uh, I found some uh, that has been transferred into a DVD now. And I met the guy who had some for sale and he said, Oh, you're the guy who produced this. You get one free. So I now have it on DVD, which is kind of <laughs> exciting. But it's it's quite a wonderful show. And uh we did uh, we made it into a show. We put music to it and you know, it, it's it's a it's a fun show. You feel like you've spent the whole weekend there with all these amazing people. Yeah, it's uh, it's like a red carpet event for the genre in general. It's really great. And I just couldn't put it down, so I just watched the whole thing. <laughs> well, one of it, we, we had a lot of special things that happened that weekend, partly because people, you know, we had this roster of, I don't know how many, but probably two dozen celebrities were there. That was a whole lot for one fan convention, but also some very special events happened, like it was Forey Ackerman's birthday. Forey Ackerman, who was the editor of Famous Monsters of Filmland, and he was a friend of mine, and we all, the whole audience sang Happy Birthday to Forey. That's part of the tape. So uh, there's a lot of very interesting stuff that happens on that video that was special that weekend. Yeah, it's it watching it it just makes you feel appreciation for the genre in general and I, that's why I really enjoy it. Now, I know that you guys are working on another documentary here soon. Can you tell us a little bit about that and who's involved and what what you're working on? Oh, I guess I can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this uh I I was trying to uh uh set up financing for a uh, a horror feature film that I've written and uh, that I think, you know, would would be a big hit. It's called Dragworms, and it's about zombies on motorcycles. 
and uh, six teenagers who confront them in Texas. What a surprise. <laughs> so I talked to a friend of mine who's a director, producer, and he said, I'm going to help you with this. And he uh, came back to me a couple, couple of weeks later and he said, here's how I'm going to help you. He said, I'm going to produce and direct a documentary feature about you and what you have done to uh, kind of bring fandom out of the closet in the last 40 years and make it the huge worldwide audience that it is today. And he decided to call the documentary From the Bridge, which was the title of my publisher's letter that opened each issue of Starlog for more than 20 years. And I said, okay, fine, that's great. Well, what's happened is that we have interviewed 30 amazing people for this documentary. And I mean people from all kinds of areas, everybody from Stan Lee to Gene Simmons. I mean, that's quite a range right there. <laughs> yeah, that's a very big we range. Have writers, we have actors, we have producers and directors. We have special effects people, makeup people. Uh, yeah, it, Dallas from Cinestate on there. Right. Yes, that's right. The, the, the guy who, the amazing guy in Dallas, Texas, who's also named Dallas, who has bought several of my magazines that uh, were not treated very well by the last owner. And he is bringing Fangoria back to life as a published newsstand magazine. And he hopes to do the same with Starlog. And uh, he is, you know, once I met him, which was just a few months ago, we added him to the interview list for From the Bridge. So he's part of that, too. And, Which guys uh, it, will be interviewing him shortly after this, actually. So. <laughs> great. He's, he, he really knows what he's doing. I mean, he has a company that's a, a multifaceted entertainment company that produces films, they publish books, and now they're in the magazine business, too. And who knows where that'll go? Because I think, uh, you know, when you're dealing with magazines, television and movies and special effects and makeup and all that kind of stuff, who knows what other projects kind of spin off from the magazines as a basis. Right. Now, do you guys, do they have, I know that you had mentioned, we previously spoke before, and you had said that this documentary is going to be coming out really soon, uh, but uh, do they have a date solidified for this yet? Uh, are you allowed to say even? Well, I, we're in post-production now. Okay. And I think that it will be finished, oh, let's say in the next few weeks, and it we have a distribution deal and it should be out and available in various ways by the end of this summer, by let's say late August. We hope to do a presentation at San Diego Comic Con in late July. And uh, in addition to showing some of the documentary film at this presentation, there will also be a lot of people at Comic Con who are in the movie because, you know, Comic-Con has a lot of celebrities from the horror field and the, and the science fiction field uh, as their guests. And a lot of them are the same people we've interviewed for the documentary. So we will have quite an interesting panel there with a lot of the celebrities from the film uh, that will join us. And we will show uh, fans of Comic-Con in San Diego, the first sneak preview of from the bridge nice really looking forward to it i really am i hope it's like it's probably i probably want it to be longer than it is <laughs> well but let me just tell you the problem is we got such great interviews with such amazing people and the director has been struggling one of the reasons we're kind of late of getting this finished later than we hoped to be was because he's having trouble cutting it down to a regular movie length. And he still says at this point that it's going to be over two hours long. So I'm, you're, you're going to get longer than a regular hour and a half movie or that you're going to get a lot more, but uh, he's still, you know, having to cut out a lot of stuff because this movie could probably be four or five hours long to really include all the good material we got. Yeah. I can't even imagine like having to wade through that many, uh, you said, uh, last time we talked, uh, about 30 guests. Yeah, there's more than 30 people. Plus we've also included, um, okay. The spoiler alert. I'm going to just tell you a few things, but you know, one of the conventions that I produced with creation years ago was 
the very first ever Star Wars celebration. Ten right. years, ten years to the day after the first Star Wars movie in May of 1977. In May of 1987, here in L.A., I produced the first ever Star Wars celebration. And George Lucas was on stage and Mark Hamill and Billy D. Williams and an amazing assortment of people. And it was a huge success. And one of the things the night that I introduced George on stage and the audience went wild, one of the surprises that I had that evening, I invited secretly a very dear friend of mine, a man named Gene Roddenberry, who created Star Trek and who is also from Texas, like me. And Gene and I shared the same birthday, too, August 19th. So I invited Gene to come and appear on stage that night. George didn't know that was going to happen. And George and Gene met and shook hands on stage for the one and only time that night. And we have video footage. It's not very good. It wasn't professionally done, unfortunately, but I have professional footage of that. So there's a lot of little things like that that we're going to include in From the Bridge that are not full-fledged interviews that we've done in the last year, but clips from the past that are kind of part of the history that celebrates the growth of fandom. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, and, and looking at the diverse, uh, you know, a lot of the fans, they uh, kind of bash heads a little bit about the Star Trek and the Star Wars thing, too. So it's like having that right there is a huge, huge thing. And, and to be honest, I think most fans are fans of both. So it's I like mean, I definitely am. And, you know, you know, fans love to kind of have their favorite thing and compete against their other friends that like something else better. And that's all part of the fun of fandom. Right. But one of the things Gene said, uh, again, spoiler alert, but uh, one of the things he said on stage that night, he said, when I first saw Star Wars, I thought, gee, I wish I'd done that. And then he said, I realized I couldn't have done that because that's not my thing. And he said, there's a lesson in that for all you people here, do your own thing. And that was Gene's kind of philosophy was, you know, do your own thing and, and, and run with it and make the most of it and have fun doing it. And, and there's a very profound lesson in that for anybody who's creative and anybody who's a fan. With the current times as today, and all the experiences both of you have had. Uh, what do you think of the current climate? Maybe we should ask Hunter actually this first. What do you think yeah. of horror today versus when you were growing up? This is the best time, I think, for the, well, anybody can say for the genre that there's ever been. And, and on that, like, uh, when there was a blockbuster two minutes away from my house, they had Fangoria on the bottom shelf, which I was like small then and I could like reach there. But my mom was <laughs> one of those people that were like, no, you can't read that, but would in turn let me get the Dragon Ball Z guides, which is like a show about people beating the shit out of each other. And- <laughs> Uh, weird double standards but um no like everything like whenever you go to conferences and ask producers like about horror movies no one will ever say bad things about it because they make great they make great return and there's also just a lot more people that are just open about their fandom for that as well yeah it seems like it's a a gladiatorial sort of thing you know like there's a that something that's ingrained into our DNA as humans that we like that sort of gladiatorial thing, even if we say we don't. Like, there's just a piece of it. Yeah. <laughs> All humans want to see something that uh, lets them see beyond everyday life. I mean, we all have our, our routines and our obligations, things that occupy our time from, you know, from, from Monday to Sunday through the week. And uh, we go to the movies and we watch television and and everything else in order to take us beyond that and let us see possibilities that everyday life does not show us. And part of that is to see people that we admire, people that inspire us, people that make us want to do more with our own heroes. And we read about them in books, and we definitely long to see them in movies. That's why 
you know, the biggest movies these days are, look at this year. What are the huge blockbuster movies that have made the most money, attracted the most audience? It's Black Panther. It's the Avengers, Infinity War. And it's the movie that I just saw last night, the new Star Wars movie, Solo. Really? Uh, okay. It and A Quiet Place also both made a lot of... Like, that's right. That's right. Too. These are these are the big blockbusters nowadays. And, you know, it's because these show us people who are larger than life. And whether, you know, whether it's Darth Vader and he's he's a huge villain or whether it's Luke Skywalker and he's a fantastic hero. These are all people that are larger than life. And we see that rather than just the kind of same boring, dull people that we see in everyday life. That's just a human need. It's always existed and always will. And the world of science fiction, horror, fantasy, comic books, superheroes shows us larger than life people that inspire us. Wow. That, I, you know what? I don't even have any more questions after that. I, I think that's probably the perfect, the perfect place to end on. A better place to close. <laughs> yeah. I mean, wow. Like this just makes me like, it's so heartfelt, you know? Yeah. But it's so true. I mean, this is, this is fundamentally what's underneath all the, you know, the ray guns and the blood and whatever else, you know, is part of the uh, effects and the trappings of these movies. It's about people. That's one of the things I loved about Solo last night is that most, a, a lot of movies that have, uh, you know, a lot of special effects and action, you know, and, and just brilliant visuals. Right. That you kind of lose the people and it. it's not so much about the people, it's about the action. But Solo, I liked it because I got involved with the people. And I'm, when I say people, I mean Wookiees and robots and androids too, you know. Uh, there's a lot of different kinds of people in this. They aren't just humans. And uh, I, I like that because I was involved with their struggles and their problems and their relationships and, and the, you know, the special effects and the, and the kabangs were just part of the dressing that made it exciting. But it was really about the people to watch Han Solo and to watch Lando and, you know, the other characters that we already know about and then to some new characters that I've never seen before. I, I just I have to say it's one of my favorite Star Wars movies and many years well that makes me want to see it for sure i know there's been some people up in the air about whether or not to see it but i'm going to see it anyway so i don't know why anybody's arguing <laughs> well because a lot of people have been disappointed in in what star wars has given us recently in fact i went with a friend last night who did not like the movie nearly as much as i did so let me just say maybe everyone is not going to love it the way carrie o'quinn did but uh it for me it was it was quite thrilling and i enjoyed the humor too because there's great little humorous moments all the way through where you know han says something that relates to something we already know about it and you know you just kind of see this is the first time he ever said that one of the things that han does in this movie does the Kessel Run. Well, we heard him refer to that in the very first Star Wars movie, and we don't even know what the Kessel Run is. And now we live through it. Right. Yeah, I think uh, I think nostalgia and how we experience it uh, in different decades of our lives really play a factor into what we're um, kind of conditioned to. So it may hit different people for different ways. So, you know, I found that like even with just 20 years behind me, you know, people who watch stuff may have a different conditioning to nostalgia that it doesn't satiate for them. So you never know. But that's good to hear. And honestly, thank you guys so much for coming on and thank you for reaching out to us. I think our uh, listeners are really going to enjoy hearing all of this. Like it really meant a lot. And I think, yeah, this is going to be a episode that won't ever be <laughs> recreated again <laughs> well i, I think too it's yeah. uh, I, it's an it's an honor to uh to be on your podcast and to go beyond the void with you and uh i uh i hope we keep in touch and may the force be with you